Hello, my name is Emiliano Topete. I am the head of the animation department at Polygon Studio. And today I'm going to be talking about the role of animation in an industry overwhelmed by motion capture. So a few years ago I was in an animation festival here in Mexico and someone said to me that the death of animation was upon us since motion capture was becoming so accessible for everyone. What this person didn't know was that motion capture has actually been there since the beginning of animation. The best example of this being Snow White, which was to a certain extent traced over a filmed actress. This early version of mocap fell quickly into disuse due to the evident lack of vitality it displayed in comparison to the energy and vividness of hand-drawn animation. I would go as far to say that it was thanks to mocap that animation could find a way of getting the boring parts out of the way and instead focus on developing the art form to its highest. And this is precisely what I believe is happening to the industry right now. The successful animation projects are not the ones achieving the realism that motion capture provides, but rather the ones that are pushing towards more expressive, wild, and design-driven outcomes. So today I'm going to show you three rigging setups that will boost your animation style in Cinema 4D. Technique number one. Limbering. If we're going to talk about animation techniques, we have to talk about Richard Williams. For all of you who don't know who he is, he is considered by many to be the animation guru. He wrote this book called The Animator's Survival Kit. And back in the 90s, he did a masterclass specifically for 3D animators. When he talks about limbering, he first points out to rubber hose animation, which is a technique that was very popular back in the 1920s since it was very funny and entertaining. But later on animators discovered a way of integrating this snap and vitality into a technique more um, realistic and believable that they called breaking the joints, which is often referred as the biggest secret in animation. There is a moment in the masterclass where an animator is hesitant to believe that this breaking of the joints is something that can be achieved in 3D animation, since it sounds like something exclusive to 2D animation. He goes ahead and asks Richard Williams, should we twist the arm? And Richard Williams tells him, well, you could try that, but if it doesn't work, Take a deep breath and break it. Great, so let's jump right in. Uh, I'm going to be using Cinema R, I'm sorry, Cinema S24 for this presentation. And what I'm going to you, show you in this first part is how to do this rig, which will allow you to break the joints in various different ways. First, uh, a simple IK system will allow us to grab this controller called the pull vector and breaking the joints just by twisting the arm realistically. So that's our first goal. But 
then we are going to proceed further on and we are going to build some complexity. I'm going to click on my secondary controllers and now as you can see we have a controller that has appeared in the elbow area of this character and now holding my four key in my keyboard I can uh, move it around and as Richard William says I can take a deep breath and break my joint just like that. And furthermore I can use this slider to rotate that same controller and have some rubber hose animation built in as well. So let's see how to achieve all of this. Okay great so let's start with our realistic rig uh, for twisting and breaking the joints. So the first thing that I'm going to do is click on this uh, icon at the corner of my viewport so that I can see the rest of the viewports and I'm going to click on the right view so that we can switch to this view and work from here. Uh, now I'm going to go to the character menu here at the top of my layout and I'm going to click on these little dots so that I can undock this menu and I'm going to leave it here in the corner so that I can uh, go back and select some of these tools since we are going to be using some of them later on. Awesome, so now let's uh, select our joint tool and holding the control key I'm going to click once, twice and three times. And now it, this kind of resembles, or I want it at least to resemble that right arm of that animator at the master class that is asking Richard Williams how to break the joints. So this is his arm, he, this is his right arm. And, um, and here in cinema, uh, if at some point you want to adjust the position of a joint, uh, you can do it, you can move it around, but of course, you will be moving the child of that joint. Uh, in order for you to do this, you must uh, click on the 7 key and uh, hold it so that you can position this in the, in the place where it best suits you. Now, the problem is that if you were ever to try this, you will be left with one little issue, which is that now, as you can see, this joint is aiming incorrectly since the z-axis is no longer looking uh, directly at the next joint as well as the second one. So this can become a problem later on when we do the IK tag. So we have to fix this now. And to fix it, it's very, very simple. You just have to middle click on that first joint so that you select the rest of the chain and you going back to our mm, character menu you just have to select joint align tool and this will give you this attributes in the attributes manager i'm going to leave everything as it is and just click on align and now i'm going to grab my move tool again and select the, both of those joints and as you can see the z-axis is pointing correctly Great, so this is a good starting point. Now, um, I would like to do some housekeeping, some uh, naming and some color coding. I like to do this while I am building. Some people um, leave this uh, at the very end of the rigging process, but I just do it as I go because it gives me clarity and peace of mind. So I'm going to rename the null as uh, arm, joint, perhaps, and let's rename this first joint is going to be our shoulder. I'm going to use my arrow key to go down and rename this as elbow and arrow key to rename this as wrist. Great. Now let's do some colors so and shapes as well. So this has a shape of a dot and it's very important to change this to none so that uh, an animator can't select this by mistake. And uh, then I'm going to the basic tab and I'm going to put a black color. And uh, these are colors that we um, randomly choose here in the studio. But you can choose whatever color you want. Uh, I'm going to choose the red color for this joint 
of the right arm. It's the color that we use for the right limbs. And I'm going to switch the icon color parameter to something like display color so that we can see that red color both here in the viewport as well as here in the object manager. And that is uh, something that I really encourage you to do so that you can keep a lot of um, order and, uh, and clarity. Great, so now we're ready to do the actual rig, the IK tag. And to do that, we can do it on three different ways or by three different methods. Uh, the first one being uh, you select that first joint in your chain. You go to the tags menu here in the object manager. And in the rigging tags option, you will find IK. And then you will just have to um, figure out which objects have to be filled out in, in this slots or fields of the tag. But there are simpler ways of doing this. This, of course, you could as well find in a right click and going to rigging tags, you can find as well the IK tag and do the same thing. But the fastest way is just to use a command. So I'm going to select that shoulder joint and back in my character menu, I'm going to, I'm going to choose create IK chain. And just like that, uh, the tag will be automatically created and the fields or the links of the tag, uh, as you can see, have already been filled out. We have our end joint and Cinema has automatically given us our goal, which is going to be our controller. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this as perhaps something like hand underscore controller. It would be a good idea to rename this as well with suffixes. So there's a tool here in the tools menu called the naming tool. And we can put here in suffix something like underscore JNT and hit on the replace name button. And now as you can see our joints have their suffix as well as our controller. I would even go further to put a GRP suffix in this object. This is just something that gives you a lot of peace of mind. Now let's borrow that red color that we have in our joints and paste it in our controller. And I'm going to switch this to display color so that we can see it. Great. Now the thing with controllers is that uh, we cannot see it right now. So the, the first rule, very important rule as a rigger, is that you have to give or hand controllers to the animators that are very easy to spot in a character. So to do this, we can go to the object tab and switch from dot to something like rectangle. And now we can make this radius parameter bigger. And now, as you can see, we can very easily find our controller. Now let's switch this orientation uh, to something like Y. And now let's go, let's switch to the coordinates tab. Now the second very important rule uh, for a rigger is to hand controllers that have clean rotation values. Being this controller, a controller of an IK system, we can easily just go to the rotation values and zero them out. Great, so this is the way that I want uh, or that you want your controllers to look. You want the Y axis to look up, you want the C axis to look back, and then you want the X axis to look sideways. Great, and uh, so now the third uh, rule for uh, for riggers regarding controllers is that you must give uh, your animators clean values and we have clean values here on scale and rotation but we have values that we cannot get rid of because we do need them uh, here in the position so the only thing that we have to do is click here in the freeze transformation group we have this freeze all button which I am going to click on. And now these values have been placed below. And as you can see, 
the coordinates of the object now are clean. Now we go through all this trouble because this way we enable the animators um, of the possibility of moving around a controller and then being able of just clicking on this reset transform icon and resetting the controller to its original position. Great. So now we have the IK working just perfectly, but we cannot twist it. As you can see, I'm going to grab my rotation tool and this doesn't rotate. So how can we achieve that first objective of twisting and breaking the joint realistically? Very easy. We just have to select our IK tag and here in the pull vector group, we just have to click on add pull and automatically Cinema 4D will give us this null that I'm going to rename as pull underscore controller. And of course, I am going to do all the, all the things that we know that are the rules for controllers. So the first thing that we know is we want to get rid of those rotation values. And regarding the position, I'm just going to bring it a little bit further on, uh, further forward and upward. Because if I were to leave it here near the, the elbow, I will leave very little space for the animator. Uh, for this boundary to be met and the twist to happen. So I'm going to put it uh, around here so that we have uh, so that the animator has a little bit more space to move around before the twist happens. Now uh, we have taken care of the rotations. The, the controller is looking uh, correctly uh, in uh, orientation wise. And now we, of course, want to freeze our transformation. So let's click on freeze all. And now all of our values are clean. Uh, so the last thing that we need, of course, is to have some sort of visibility so that this controller is easy to spot by any animator. So let's go ahead and switch to the object tab. And here on the shape attribute, I'm going to change it to something like pyramid and I'm going to switch the orientation to Z. Great, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so that we can see it. And now, if, uh, well, the last thing that I would like to do is just to change the color. I'm going to put on here on display color and I'm going to right click and paste that red color. And here I'm going to switch to display color so that we can see how our viewport perfectly matches our object manager. Great, and now let's test uh, things out. If I were to grab this pull vector and move it to the other uh, end of that arm, as you can see, I can twist and break the joint realistically. Great, and if I were to click on this PSR button, the controller will jump back into position. So our first objective has been made. Now, we're going to build some complexity since we want to be able of achieving this uh, thing that Richard Williams then says when, when he talks about just uh, take a deep breath and go ahead and break the joint. Uh, so as you can see, we cannot do this just by grabbing the joint and moving it since the position of this joint has been compromised by the IGATA. So we have to find a way around this. So the way that we are going to achieve this is by doing a second chain of joints that is going to be driven by this first chain of joints, and, but that is going to be able of giving us a control over the elbow joint for us to, to, to push or to pull around however we wish. So let's go back to our right view and I am going to select my spline tool, which I have here in my spline menu, great spline pen. Now uh, I am going to click um, once, twice and three times and I'm going to hit the escape key.
And let me very quickly select this second joint so that I can show you uh, why we are creating a spline. And the reason is because as you can see here, this is exactly the behavior that we want to have in that elbow area. So, um, what we need to do is a second chain of joints that will have this kind of behavior to it. So I'm going to unselect everything and then I'm going to go back to my character menu and select my joint tool. Holding the control key, I'm going to randomly create uh, something like perhaps 11 joints and uh, that I just don't have to worry right now to the way that this looks and the distribution of these joints since they are going to evenly distribute along this spline and uh, that is going to be thanks to another tag that we're going to place so let's bring our second chain of joints and place it below the first one uh, I'm going to do some housekeeping here as you might have guessed I'm going to rename this as bind joints since these are going to be the joints that are actually going to be bound to the mesh of the character and to rename all of this I'm going to show you a trick that I use I'm going to click on that first joint and I'm going to click on the X to type an X I'm going to copy this X and with my arrow key I'm going to move down to paste that same X on the rest of those joints now I'm going to middle click on the first to select the rest of the joint uh, in, the, in that chain and going back to my naming tool I'm going to use the replace method I'm going to type X so that I can replace it with something like BD for binding space and in order for us to be able of putting a number sequentially through that chain of joints we just have to put the money I'm sorry the money symbol and the capital N and now I'm going to click on the replace name button and now as you can see we have a sequence of numbers placed upon each of those joints great now let's do some colors so I would like to middle click once more and I'm going to change this color to something like purple for those bind joints I'm going to switch to display color and now I'm going to put uh, perhaps a, well I, I was forgetting perhaps it would be good to go back to the naming tool and let's do the suffix we need a suffix of joint since we are being very clean and organized, I'm going to put a suffix of group here as well. And let's change this. We don't want it to have any shape. And in our basic tab, I'm going to switch this play color to on. And this I want it to be black. I'm going to switch to this play color. Great. So now everything is looking good. We could even go ahead and change the spline. We can borrow the well I'm going to borrow the red color here so I'm going to copy it and I'm going to play paste it in the spline and say display color great so now everything is looking good and now we want to go ahead and do the actual rig of this chain of joints we're going to do another tag called the IK spline tag so we can right click and go to rigging tags and we will find here IK spline. Here it's very important to change the type from fit to equal since this is the responsible attribute in the tag that it's going to distribute evenly all these joints throughout the length of our spline. So very important to change the type to equal. Align, it's perfectly fine to leave it uh, as Z as well as the axis. And now we just have to drag our spline to the spline field and our end joint to the end field. And now as you can see, all of our joints have jumped 
into position. Great. I'm going to leave the twist parameter as none for this exercise. And to finish, I just have to go to the Handles tab and click three times on the Add button. And I will be able of uh, hitting as well the Create button three times. And in this way, Cinema 4D will give us this three nodes that uh, let me show you. I'm going to switch to Object Mode and select my Move tool. And now these nodes are going to be moving those points in that spline. So uh, I'm going to go ahead now and rename this one as uh, Shoulder. The next one I'm going to rename as Elbow. And finally, the last one is going to be the Wrist. And these three nodes are handles, so let's go back to our naming tool. I'm using my history tool here, and I'm going to switch to naming tool. And I am going to use a suffix of hdnl for handle. I'm going to click on replace name, and I'm going to use a color here. So let's switch to object. I don't want a shape here so that I cannot select it by mistake. And the color, it's going to be something like white is perfect. And in the icon color, I want to choose this play color so that we can see this white in our icons. Great. So now, what we want to do is we want to position these objects uh, within uh, our drive joints. So we just have to figure out which goes where. So I'm going to grab my shoulder handle and I'm going to make it a child of the shoulder joint, the elbow as a child of the elbow and the wrist as a child of the wrist. And just by doing that, we can now go ahead and let me show you. We can go to the coordinates tab and whenever you have a child, an, an object as a child of another object and you want to place it in that same position, you can go to the coordinates and zero them out. So now, as you can see, this handle has jumped into position. We can go as well and zero the rotations values. So let's do the same for the rest of the handles. Or we can just go and click on the PSR button. And now, as you can see, we can grab our hand controller, switch to our move tool, or better yet, our rectangle selection so that we can select our hand controller and now as you can see our two chains are moving together. Great. Now um, I think I'm going to switch to my perspective view so that uh, I'm going to show you so that we can see clearly the difference between these two chains. I'm going to select that first joint and I am going to switch to the Object tab and here in the Bone group I'm going to change from Standard to Box. And instead of Length I am going to use Custom. And I am doing all of this so that I can make this a little bit bigger so that we can see clearly uh, one chain of joints, uh, the drive chain of, jo of joints from the one that is going to be bound to the character. Great, so now if we were to move it around, we can see it clearly what's going on. Now, the last thing that we need to do is we need to have some sort of control that will allow us to grab this handle and pulling it or pushing it around. So the what I would do here is just something very easy. I would go to the Null menu and bring in a Null object. I'm going to rename this one as Elbow. Um, controller and this one I'm going to make it a circle I'm going to make it big enough so that we can spot it very easily and now let's go to the basic tab and let's put that red color in and change the display to display color so that we can see that red color and let's bring it here with the rest of the controllers now let's remember our rules for, for the controllers. So remember the first thing that obviously we, we need is for this controller to be 
in the same position as the joint of the elbow. So we're going to do the same thing that we did with the handles. We're going to make it a child of the joint and then we're going to zero out, in this case, only the positions. We're going to leave the rotations alone so that we don't um, inherit the rotations of the joint since remember they are not clean and we do want clean rotation values uh, or coordinates in our axis. So to get rid of these values of course we just have to freeze them and just like that we can go ahead and grab our handle and make it a child of the controller and this controller, uh, we are not able of seeing it clearly because I have to go back to my object tab and the orientation I'm going to switch it to Y. Great, and let's make this a little bit bigger. Great, so now if I were to select that elbow controller, I am able of mm, pulling it or pushing it and therefore I can see Richard William in directly in the eyes and say, yes, I can take a deep breath and break my joint. And so now the last thing that we have already built in and we haven't even figured out is that uh, using this method, we can as well mm, get, get, uh, get away with rubber hose animation style if we wanted to. Uh, I'm going to rotate this elbow controller and now as you can see uh, right now it's very subtle but if we were to go to the eye case plank tag and bring this dead uh, slider a little bit um, put, uh, to, the, to the right we can make this tangent a little bit bigger and this will allow us to create rubber hose filling or style very easily so just like that we have in this rig all the possibilities that we want. Uh, I'm going to reset the PSR. We have our realistic twisting with our pull vector, but if we were to take a deep breath, we can as well break that joint, just like that, and we can have, if we wanted to or needed to, the possibility of achieving the rubber hose animation style of the 1920s. Awesome. Perhaps no other animation principle conveys the illusion of life as compellingly as the squash and stretch method. This is because, contrary to the rigid movement of any object like a chair or a book, anything made out of living flesh will have, to a certain degree, a change within its shape when it moves. Therefore, by using this formula, you can bestow upon any object the illusion of life which, by the way, I'm taking from The Illusion of Life of Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson. Great, so in order for us to do a squash and stretch sensations inside of cinema, it's very simple. Uh, I'm going to choose a capsule and holding my shift key, I am going to my deformer menu and I'm going to choose squash and stretch. And just like that, I have placed as a child of that capsule the deformer and if I were to go to its attributes, I can play around with the factor slider and we uh, would have built in that squash and stretch uh, ready to go. So this is very fast and very easy to do and it works in a lot of cases. But we found that when it comes to animation, uh, using sliders isn't that organic for an animator. So let me show you what we did. This is right here is one of our characters uh, in, in a series that we called Ruliver. This is an intergalactic entrepreneur called Hubris. And uh, let me go to the layers, um, the layer manager, and I'm going to bring in the visibility of my secondary controllers. So that we can see this little controller over here that if we were to select it and bring it down, we have that squash and stretch sensation. Awesome. But what's very good about this controller is that you don't have to go and do the squash and stretch in a slider. You can do it here just by holding the four key and moving it 
around and as you can see you can as well you don't have to stick to the y-axis you can go sideways as well so this becomes a very organic workflow for animators instead of having to use sliders so I'm going to show you how to achieve this so I'm going to create a new uh, file and I'm going to create a capsule as well but this time I'm going to hold my shift key and instead of the squash and stretch I'm going to choose freeform deformer and uh, the very cool thing about the freeform deformer is that it has points so first let's go ahead and uh, switch to the object tab and turn those three lines in each axis to two lines since we are going uh, only to use two lines on each axis great so now let me show you if we were to switch to points mode and select those points at the top of the deformer and move them around we can deform that capsule so what we want to do now is we want to create joints that will allow an animator to move those points around. So to do this, let's deselect everything and let's go to our character menu and select joint. I am going to the display menu and switch to lines and there you can see we have our joint sitting at the center of the world. So we can grab our move tool, switch to object mode and bring it uh, around an average where it's supposed to be so that it moves these four points. But there is a better way of doing this. Let me show you. We can select the freeform deformer, switch to points mode, bring back our rectangle selection tool, select those four points, go back to the character menu and in convert we can choose selection to joints. And just like that, as you can see, a joint has been created at the average uh, position of that point selection, which is something very cool. So now let's go ahead and rename this joint down. I'm going to switch its display to sphere so that we can see it clearly. And let's switch its color to red. And I'm going to change the icon color here as well so that we can see that red color in the object manager. Great. So now let's do the same thing for the points at the top. Let's select the deformer. I'm going to select now the four points and I'm going to character convert selection to joints. We have our joint uh, in the average and let's go ahead and rename it up Let's change its color to blue and switch to display color. And in the object tab, let's change the display to sphere. So now, as you can see, we have our two joints. And now to make the relationship, we can bind since the freeform deformer has points. So I'm going to deselect all the points uh, so that the automatic binding works correctly and now I'm going to uh, with holding my command key in my keyboard I'm going to select the two joints and I am going back to the character menu and choose bind this little window will appear and I will leave everything as it is and I will choose OK great so now as you can see a weights tag has been created on the freeform deformer with those two joints and a skin deformer has been placed as a child of that deformer. A deformer deforming a deformer. Very deep stuff as Noseman would say. Great, so now I'm going to double click just to mouse over those points and as, as you can see we have a 100% of influence in that up joint in these four points and here at the bottom we have a 100% of influence in the uh, off the down joint amazing
Great, so now let's try this out. We can switch to object mode, grab our move tool and select the up joint. And if we were to move it around holding the 4 key, now we have our squash and stretch. And this, well, we are almost there. As, we, as you can see, we have figured out uh, how to play with the height. But we have to, and I mean, I, if I were to select these joints and switch to the scale tool and scale them, but not with the model mode, with the object mode, then we could change the width, which is something that we want. So right now we have to figure out a way of making a relationship between the, the height and the width of these joints. And to do that, we can use an Expresso tag. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to click on my Null menu. I'm going to bring this new Null and I'm going to rename it Expresso. And here I'm going to right click. I'm going to uh, Programming tags and I'm going to choose the Expresso. And this window appears. I'm going to leave it very big so that we can see what's going on and I'm going to bring my capsule here so that we can see it still. Great. Now, the way that the Expresso works is that you can bring objects from the object manager and as you can see they transform into these little boxes that have these two ports, input ports that will allow you to drive attributes off this object and output port that will allow you to drive uh, attributes um, from the attributes of this object. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to um, click on the output port and we have all of these attributes. We're going to coordinates and we're going to choose the global position. And this will allow us to find uh, the, the distance between those two joints. So what we need now is to bring that other joint into our Expresso. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to the output port. We're going to the global position attributes and we're going to bring it in. Great. And what I would like to do is to make some housekeeping here. I want to put that blue color that we have been using for this joint. Good. And now I'm going to put the red color in this other one so that we can match everything and everything is very clear. Awesome. So to find out what's the distance, what's the number between these two joints, we can go ahead and we can uh, click on this search icon in the X pool and we can type the word distance. And here you will find that there is a distance node that if you were to drag it and drop it, you can then uh, connect that global position of any given object to those inputs in the distance node and it will tell you what the distance is. Now, we don't have that result in the attributes manager of the distance node, but we can go here as well in the search bar and type result. And we have a result node that we can drag and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so that we can see the number clearly. And now I'm going to connect that distance node to the result. And now we have a number, 200. Awesome. So what we want is um, to drive the scale in X and in Z of those joints uh, for uh, with this change of position. So to do that, I am going to duplicate that same object with holding the control key in my keyboard and I'm going to double click on the output port because here we want to bring in an input port. We want to drive an attribute off the object and the attribute that we want to drive is the X scale as well as the C scale. Oops, the C scale. Great. And we want to do the same for the uh, 
for the other joint. So hold down the control key. I'm going to duplicate that box. And uh, to replace it, you just have to grab the object and drop it in the box. I'm going to change that color to red so that we keep our uh, things organized and we have a lot of clarity and peace of mind. Great. And now we have to figure out how to turn this to 100 to this number 1 and keep this inverse relationship between when the height uh, decreases, the width increases. And that sounds a lot like math. So don't get uh, nervous. I'm going to type here, here, math. And luckily for all of us, we have a math node. Now, by default, uh, this is going to be in add, but we can go to the node and change the function to divide. And this is precisely what we need. We need to divide. Now, I need you to be brave here and remember your classes uh, from high school. I'm going to bring my doodle paint. And there was something that we learned that was the proportionality functions um, that said that if you were to have um, this kind of equation, this number would be directly proportional to this number at the top and would be inversely proportional, directly proportional and inversely proportional to the number at the bottom. So to confirm what our teachers taught us uh, all those years ago, we can go ahead and connect this 200 number at the bottom of this division. And in the first input here in the parameter, we're going to type 200. Great. So let's grab that result node. I'm going to duplicate it holding the control key to see what result we have. And if I connect it, there it is. We have that one number, which is what we needed to drive this scale in both uh, joints. So let's connect that output of that division to the scale of X and to the scale of C of both joints. Now let's try things out. I'm going to switch to my move tool. I'm going to select my uh, up joint and if I were to hold my 4 key and move around, beautiful. Now we have this very organic squash and stretch. We can go sideways and uh, most important of all, we know that our math teachers were telling us the truth. This is a lovely way of teaching. This is the way that I am going to teach my children how to divide. Right? I mean, this is beautiful. The more people invited to the party, the less piece of cake. The less people invi invited to the party, the more mm, piece of the more cake you have. So, uh, yeah, that teacher of math was telling you the truth all those years ago. Awesome. So this is the way that we can achieve this um, very organic uh, rig that will allow animators to, to work their spacing in their animators very organically instead of having to, to go to the attributes manager and playing around with sliders. There is a quote I love by an animator called Norman McLaren. He says, animation is not the art of drawings that move, but the art of movements that are drawn. And nothing conveys this idea better than smears. So lesson number three, smears. A smear is an animation technique that is often used to enhance the sensation of speed. It is meant to emulate the phenomena of the blur that we all know from the world of photography. In 1942, the Warner Brothers Studio took this concept and turned it into drawings in this project called The Dover Boys, which blew everybody's minds. And I think it still does.
Now, this particular effect has avoided 3D animation for many years, since it requires a huge and unrealistic amount of deformation. But we have found a couple of ways of achieving it using Cinema 4D. So let me show you. Here I have a scene with, um, with, a, with a character of ours called Dr. Gel, and I am going to show you uh, how to push this pose um, so that we can have a smear. So I'm going to grab uh, this controller right here, which we have built in this controller. This sliders that will allow us to, to enhance certain uh, properties to the, to the rig. Uh, it's very important uh, to have a stretch limit in the limbs of a character so that you don't lose the proportion that the concept artist designed for the, for the character. But as an animator, you uh, have to, to have the possibility of going further. So what we did is we placed this slider that will allow us to bring the stretch to stretching possibilities in certain in-betweens. So for example, here we could do a smear. We would just have to bring this arm. I'm going to do something very crazy. I'm going to bring it over here. And now I'm going to my layer manager and I'm going to click on the visibility of my secondary controllers. And I'm going to display and go to lines so that I can find here in my elbow that controller which I showed you a little bit earlier in the presentation. Uh, that is the, the controller for the elbow. So I'm going to hold my 4 key in my keyboard and so that I can bring it here. And into this controller we have also built a slider called the boost which it just does a very beautiful curve uh, in, the, in the spline that is built beneath the, the joints, the system of joints of that arm. Beautiful. So now, in order for us to, to finish this smear, what we can do is uh, play around with the fingers on the hand. Because here in the hand, we have FK controllers that, of course, are meant uh, to just rotate. But here in Polygon Studio, I always ask the animators not to restrict these controllers because they can be used for this smear uh, principle. So as you can see, I can grab them and instead of rotating these FK controllers, I can use them to generate and design these very uh, interesting smears that we have been talking about. And, uh, and this is the reason why it's very important not to restrict your controllers when you are rigging. So as you can see, you can get away with very interesting things. You can achieve smears in this way. But this is not the only way of achieving smears inside of Cinema 4D. We can as well do it with a deformer. So I'm going to hit B and I'm going to switch to another project inside of Cinema. And inside of this project I have two characters and I am um, here in this 350 frame. This character is moving very fastly. So I want to create a smear on him. So I'm going to unfold uh, his hierarchy. And here in the meshes of that character I have uh, two groups which hold all the meshes that that character has. So I'm going to the deformer menu and I'm going to choose camera deformer and I'm going to place this deformer as the sibling of those two nodes. And now I am going to switch to point mode and as you can see this camera deformer has a grid and on this grid we have uh, points that intersect the lines and if I were to select one of those points, I could move it around and I will deform the mesh of the character. And this way, I can create my smears very fast, very easy, and, uh, and with, with, in, with a lot of possibilities of, of designing just whatever wild thing 
I can I can get away with. So I'm going to show you the clip so that you can see how this ended. To wrap up, we can safely say that mocap has been, still is, and always will be a very useful resource. But animation is an art form, as long as it carries within it the heart and soul of human expression. It is our duty as a generation to study the principles and formulas that these great artists have left us, and to use these amazing new tools like Cinema 4D to continue the legacy of the limitless art of animation. Thank you very much. I hope you found this presentation useful. And if you wish to contact me, please do so at this address, emiliano at polygon.tv. And you can as well find us in Instagram as Polygon Animation.